Welcome to the Class 9 video. Once again, I'm going to be jumping back to an older version of the video with a different numbering. Also, this time, uh, it, things were set up so that you were supposed to watch the video before you did the exercise. Although, really, it's fine if you do the video and the exercise in any order that helps you make sense of the material. This is in her essay, Narrative Bias, Social Structure, and Explanation. Hasslinger is a very similar thinker to Iris Marion Young. They I think both take similar approaches to political issues and how to understand them philosophically. So it's useful to work with them together uh, in order to understand things like what's going on in your primary reading. So I want to start by reviewing some of what's going on in Young, and then we'll talk about Hasslinger. So review of Young. Uh, in week two, we read Political Responsibility and Structural Injustice. That's the one that began with the story of someone being evicted. And then last week, we read Five Faces of Oppression. So, essentially, um, pol Political Responsibility and Structural Injustice gave us uh, two sets of concepts. One is a pair of concepts around justice. Um, we can think about individual injustice, which is just what we ordinarily think of when we think about wrongdoing, an injustice caused by an individual. But we can also think about structural injustice, and this she defines as injustice due to social structures that many people participate in. And going along with these two notions of justice are two notions of responsibility. So uh, there's what she calls the liability model of responsibility, or just we can think of it as responsibility as liability. Um, and this is when we hold individuals responsible for events that they caused directly. And there's a lot of discussion of the contrast between liability responsibility and political responsibility. But the point is that liability responsibility goes with individual action, whereas political responsibility goes with structural injustice. This is our duty to deal with injustices that are caused by social structures. Complementary essay um, was Five Faces of Oppression which talks about mechanisms of oppression rather than individual oppressed groups. Um, and so this gives us a sense of what sorts of things we are trying to deal with when we are dealing with structural injustice. And so the five faces of oppression were exploitation, marginalization, powerlessness, cultural imperialism, and violence. The important thing to see about all of these is that they were defined as relationships between groups. So exploitation wasn't about, for instance, an individual landlord and an individual tenant. It was uh, the systematic transfer of resources that are the products of labor from one group to another, right? And so going along with this is uh, Young's notion of a social group. Right, Because for Young, the kinds of political problems she's concerned with are fundamentally about groups rather than individuals. So social groups, she says, are based around people with common experiences. Um, not perfectly identical experiences, but something that um, gives them a sense of having had this sh same life story. So we can talk about the experience of African Americans in the United States, or we can talk about the experiences of women. Um, and these are, so these are defined not by attributes, not simply by say, saying, say, being left-handed or having a X, having two X chromosomes, but by a sense of identity. So it's about an experience and then your understanding of how that experience creates who you are. Um, social groups are always defined in opposition to other groups, not necessarily oppression, but opposition. You always need to have a contrast or perhaps several contrasts. And she says that 
social groups are not necessarily bad. Eliminating oppression does not mean eliminating group identity. This is going to be important for a lot of people for whom their group identity is, an import, is important for their sense of self. Um, these identities are often not chosen. You are just born um, and people label you male or female or black or white or whatever. Okay, so that is broadly uh, the same approach that Hassling is going to be dealing with. There'll be some subtle differences, especially around their understanding of what it means to be a social group. Um, but, and some of those actually aren't so subtle. But still, we have this focus on uh, injustice as a social and group process. So now we get to Hasslinger on implicit bias and structural injustice. So implicit bias is a common enough term. People seem to understand it pretty readily, and um, it's one that gets kicked around in the media all the time. And so implicit bias is just an unconscious prejudice, like unconscious racism or unconscious sexism. So we can define it this way. Unconscious attitudes or stereotypes about groups of people that impact behavior. Um, and implicit bias is a powerful tool for talking about things like racism and sexism because it allows us to talk about racist and sexist behavior without claiming that people have overt hateful beliefs. Um, this is all operating at an unconscious level. And so this becomes very popular, for instance, in workplace diversity trainings. People will talk about um, implicit bias rather than um, explicit uh, prejudice. So talking about implicit bias is good, right? It, um, it enables us to identify a mechanism by which individuals wind up causing harm to other individuals. But Haslinger's basic thesis is that it is not enough to talk about implicit bias. We also have to talk about structural injustice. And structural injustice was the key concept in Iris Marian Young. Um, so again, we can continue to think about this as simply being injustice caused by structures, social structures that many people participate in. So um, Hasslinger has two basic lines of argument for the claim that um, we need to talk not just about implicit bias, but structural injustice. One is that things like racism and sexism are primarily social structures. That's the key to them. They're not individual actions or attitudes, whether those attitudes are conscious or unconscious. Furthermore, we cannot right the wrongs of racism, sexism, etc., simply by focusing on individual actions or attitudes. So these two go together, obviously. Basically, the problem isn't individual attitudes, and the problem can't be solved by focusing on individual attitudes. So she has arguments for both of these theses. Um, uh, so for the claim that racism, sexism, etc., are primarily social structures and not individual actions or attitudes, she gives two reasons two premises. First of all, racist and sexist attitudes are neither necessary nor sufficient for racial and sexual oppression. Uh, well, she fills this out in, uh, in immense detail later in the essay, but the basic point is that racism and sexism can persist even when no one is individually um, uh, in, in individually has these negative attitudes, either consciously or unconsciously. Furthermore, the moral problem is not the bad attitude, but it's the unfair relationship. If people have a bad attitude, 
and it doesn't wind up actually impacting how people go through life materially and um, whether their um, uh, lives are, are, are as fulfilling and rich as they could be, then that's not, um, that's not a problem. We're not here to identify bl uh, people with bad attitudes and blame them for bad attitudes. We are here to change the way society is structured so that everyone has more opportunities to flourish. Okay, so um, that's, on, that's on the side that says we need to focus on social structures. I'm sorry, that the, the wrong itself is a wrong with social structures, not a wrong with attitudes. Um, so we cannot right the wrongs of racism and sexism by focusing on these actions or attitudes. Why is that? Well, one is that structural injustice can persist after attitudes change. This is going to be a lot of what we look at later in the essay. You're going to see situations where society was built by people with racist or sexist attitudes. And even though the racist and sexist attitudes, we can imagine that they have gone away completely. They haven't really gone away completely, but we could imagine that they go away completely, and yet the structural injustice still persists. The other thing is that people are really resentful when they are blamed for structural problems, and resentful people are resistant to change. So if you go around trying to root out the um, hidden sexism or hidden racism in people's souls, they're just going to get mad at you, and they're not going to change the fundamental power relationship. And that's what we're actually concerned with, the social structure. So these two come together. Um, racism and sexism are primarily social structures. We cannot right the wrong of them without talking about simply by focusing on individual actions or attitudes. Therefore, we need to talk about implicit bias. I'm sorry. Therefore, it is not sufficient to talk about implicit bias. We must talk about structural injustice. And so you can think of the argument as flowing down in this fashion. From these basic premises, um, we, we get conclusion, we get intermediate conclusions and then we come down to the final conclusion. It is not enough to talk about implicit bias. We have to talk about structural injustice. Now, part of her argument here, especially for the claim that structural injustice persists after attitudes change and, you know, racist and sexist attitudes are neither necessary nor sufficient for racial or sexual oppression, Part of her argument here then hinges on what we're going to talk about next, which is Hasslinger's ideas about social structure and explanation. Basically, she wants to get away from what she, what she calls standard stories. Standard stories attempt to explain social phenomenon, phenomena by appealing to the conscious behavior of a limited number of individuals in a limited place and time. So um, if you read history and you find that the hist your history book is focused entirely on the actions of great leaders, then you're looking at a standard story that sort of says, you know, um, the uh, Roman Empire rose because um, these people were heroic, the Roman Empire fell because these people were um, cowardly, that sort of thing. But the fact is, social structures um, change differently. We can't explain social structures simply by looking at the actions of individuals. So what Haslinger asks us to do is look at three kinds of cases where you see injustice, right? But there are no individuals whose bad attitudes or um, 
actions are currently upholding those modes of injustice. And so this is what I want you to look at for the next exercise. So those three um, ex kinds of examples are examples of social constraints and enablements, social meaning, and material conditions and resources. So what I'm gonna want you to do um, for the exercise coming up is look at her examples um, for these three sorts of things, explain them, and then come up with your own examples from the book that um, will uh, help you, that, that illustrate what's going on here. And this would again, I think, allow us to see how it is that um, structural injustice can persist even without um, implicit or explicit bias.